Chapters twenty one and twenty two of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty one. But behold, as soon as I went out on the adventure path, I met John Barleycorn again. I moved through a world of strangers, and the act of drinking together made one acquainted with men and opened the way to adventures. It might be in a saloon with jingled townsmen, or with a genial railroad man well lighted up and armed with pocket flasks, or with a bunch of alky stiffs in a hangout. Yes, and it might be in a prohibition state, such as Iowa was in 1894, when I wandered up the main street of Des Moines and was variously invited by strangers into various blind pigs. I remember drinking in barber shops, plumbing establishments, and furniture stores. Always it was John Barleycorn. Even a tramp in those halcyon days could get most frequently drunk. I remember inside the prison at Buffalo how some of us got magnificently jingled and how, on the streets of Buffalo after our release, another jingle was financed with pennies begged on the main drag. I had no call for alcohol, but when I was with those who drank, I drank with them. I insisted on traveling or loafing with the livest, keenest men, and it was just these live, keen ones that did most of the drinking. They were the more comradely men, the more venturous, the more individual. Perhaps it was too much temperament that made them turn from the commonplace and humdrum to find relief in lying and fantastic sureties of John Barleycorn. Be that as it may, the men I liked best, desired most to be with, were invariably to be found in John Barleycorn's company. In the course of my tramping over the United States, I achieved a new concept. As a tramp, I was behind the scenes of society, aye, and down in the cellar. I could watch the machinery work. I saw the wheels of the social machine go around, and I learned that the dignity of manual labor wasn't what I had been told it was by the teachers, preachers, and politicians. The men without trades were helpless cattle. If one learned a trade, he was compelled to belong to a union in order to work at his trade. And his union was compelled to bully and slug the employers' unions in order to hold up wages or hold down hours. The employers' unions likewise bullied and slugged. I couldn't see any dignity at all. And when a workman got old or had an accident, he was thrown into the scrap heap like any worn out machine. I saw too many of this sort who were making anything but dignified ends of life. So my new concept was that manual labor was undignified and that it didn't pay. No trade for me was my decision, and no superintendent's daughters. And no criminality, I also decided. That would be almost as disastrous as to be a laborer. Brains paid, not brawn, and I resolved never again to offer my muscles for sale in the brawn market. 
brain and brain only would I sell. I returned to California with the firm intention of developing my brain. This meant school education. I had gone through the grammar school long ago, so I entered the Oakland High School. To pay my way, I worked as a janitor. My sister helped me, too. And I was not above mowing anybody's lawn or taking up and beating carpets when I had half a day to spare. I was working to get away from work, and I buckled down to it with a grim realization of the paradox. Boy and girl love was left behind, and along with it, Haiti and Louis Shattuck and the early evening strolls. I hadn't the time. I joined the Henry Clay Debating Society. I was received into the homes of some of the members where I met nice girls whose skirts reached the ground. I dallied with little home clubs wherein we discussed poetry and art and the nuances of grammar. I joined the socialist local where we studied and orated political economy, philosophy, and politics. I kept half a dozen membership cards working in the free library and did an immense amount of collateral reading. And for a year and a half on end, I never took a drink, nor thought of taking a drink. I hadn't the time, and I certainly did not have the inclination. Between my janitor work, my studies, and innocent amusements such as chess, I hadn't a moment to spare. I was discovering a new world, and such was the passion of my exploration that the old world of John Barleycorn held no inducements for me. Come to think of it, I did enter a saloon. I went to see Johnny Heinhold in The Last Chance, and I went to borrow money. And right here is another phase of John Barleycorn. Saloon keepers are notoriously good fellows. On an average, they perform vastly greater generosities than do businessmen. When I simply had to have ten dollars, desperate, with no place to turn, I went to see Johnny Heinhold. Several years had passed since I had been in his place or spent a cent across his bar. And when I went to borrow the ten dollars, I didn't buy a drink either. And Johnny Heinhold let me have the ten dollars without security or interest. More than once, in the brief days of my struggle for an education, I went to see Johnny Heinhold to borrow money. When I entered the university, I borrowed forty dollars from him, without interest, without security, without buying a drink. And yet, and here is the point, the custom and the code, in the days of my prosperity, after the lapse of years, I have gone out of my way by many a long block to spend across Johnny Heinhold's bar deferred interest on the various loans. Not that Johnny Heinhold asked me to do it, or expected me to do it. I did it, as I have said, in obedience to the code I have learned along with all the other things connected with John Barleycorn. In distress, when a man has no other place to turn, when he hasn't the slightest bit of security which a savage-hearted pawnbroker would consider, he can go to some saloon keeper he knows. Gratitude is inherently human. When the man so helped has money again, depend upon it 
that a portion will be spent across the bar of the saloon keeper who befriended him why i recollect the early days of my writing career when the small sums of money i earned from the magazines came with tragic irregularity while at the same time i was staggering along with a growing family a wife children a mother a nephew and my mammy jenny and her old husband fallen on evil days there were two places at which i could borrow money a barber shop and a saloon the barber charged me five per cent per month in advance that is to say when i borrowed one hundred dollars he handed me ninety-five the other five dollars he retained as advance interest for the first month and on the second month i paid him five dollars more and continued to do so each month until i made a ten strike with the editors and lifted the loan the other place to which i came in trouble was the saloon the saloon keeper i had known by sight for a couple of years i had never spent my money in his saloon and even when i borrowed from him i didn't spend any money yet never did he refuse me any sum i asked of him unfortunately before i became prosperous he moved away to another city and to this day i regret that he is gone it is the code i have learned the right thing to do and the right thing i do right now did i know where he is would be to drop in on occasion and spend a few dollars across his bar for old sake's sake and gratitude this is not to exalt saloon keepers i have written it to exalt the power of john barleycorn and to illustrate one more of the myriad ways by which a man is brought in contact with john barleycorn until in the end he finds he cannot get along without him but to return to the run of my narrative away from the adventure path up to my ears in study every moment occupied i lived oblivious to john barleycorn's existence nobody about me drank if any had drunk and had they offered it to me i surely would have drunk as it was when i had spare moments i spent them playing chess or going with nice girls who were themselves students or in riding a bicycle whenever i was fortunate enough to have it out of the pawnbroker's possession what i am insisting upon all the time is this in me was not the slightest trace of alcoholic desire and this despite the long and severe apprenticeship i had served under john barleycorn i had come back from the other side of life to be delighted with this arcadian simplicity of student youths and student maidens also i had found my way into the realm of the mind and i was intellectually intoxicated alas as i was to learn at a later period intellectual intoxication too has its katzenjammer 